Yeah, I grew up on the south coast uh, near Littlehampton, which is a seaside town with all the associated rubbish that goes along with seaside towns. Um, I went to school there, and you know we were um, we were just ordinary lads and lasses. You know, in a small town growing up, there was very little culture. Um, we were all more interested in sports. But as I became older, and I was actually encouraged to by certain teachers to to draw and paint, I also got very much into kind of music. You know, this is this is we're talking like mid seventies here. So I got into sort of like weird music. And I was listening to a lot of you know heavy rock, progressive rock, uh, weird experimental stuff like Eno and, and Robert Fripp, um, and I and this really started to take over my life along with the the interest in, in drawing and painting. And this is because it was a way out of my culture. It was a way out of what I could see around me and what was like laying in wait for me once I left school, which was a pretty poor job really. Um, and it was just a, an escape, a fantasy. But I had a group of friends that were, you know, where we would share interests, especially music interests. And then punk happened, of course, which was really exciting. I wasn't a punk per se, a lot of my friends were, but I loved a lot of punk, and I loved a lot of progressive rock, so I used to kind of play the two, which of course wasn't allowed in the very tribal youth culture of the time. You either have to be a hippie or a punk or a rasta or scar person or you know you couldn't mix and match and I loved to mix and match um, but that interest in music I think really I thought of it as an alternative to the world that I saw around me and I think that led to my later interest in in painting going to art school and also the kind of jobs that I had before I went to art school I took the step to go to a um, foundation course art and design course in Worthing from my school in Northampton because I went to one of these career interviews with my dad and the career guy said so you like doing drawing and painting and you like Sabutio and you like you know military modelling and you know why don't you go to art school and I thought oh yeah why not what else am I going to do yeah after foundation I started working in graphic as a graphic artist um, was originally employed as a kind of lifo plate maker, if anyone can remember what that means. But in those days, you were you were as a, as a paste up artist, you were expected to you know produce folders and posters and brochures for local companies. And I did that for nearly two years. Then I moved away from my hometown because I just got a bit fed up. I just wanted to do something, and I ended up near Farnham in Hampshire. And I got a job there, amazingly, as a graphic artist. And I was there for two years doing slide tape shows where I would be uh, responsible for doing the artwork along with a team for, um, for 35 mil slide tape shows with sound. So it was a bit like producing a film or something. I actually left the job in 84, that second job I had, um, to go and do a BA in fine art at Bath Academy of Art. So I was, I was 23 when I started. So I was a late starter um, in that sense. And I realized that graphic design was not for me. It wasn't really, yeah, it wasn't for me. I thought at this stage I wanted to be an artist, but again, like being a kid, you don't really know what that means, but you've got this kind of idealized fantasy so, for example, you know, I'd seen a film about Jackson Pollock. I wanted to be Jackson Pollock. I wanted to walk around town with paint on my trousers because it was really cool. I mean, this is really kind of cliched. Anyway, there I am, first term, first year, with all these cliches about what is art and what isn't art. Um, and it's made very clear to me very quickly that these are cliches. I had two brilliant contextual studies tutors called um, Angela Partington and Robin Mariner who um, were responsible for your essays and they were just asking me a lot of kind of postmodern questions about the role of authorship, what the role of the artist meant in culture 
Um, they didn't direct me to, to artists per se, but I was reading a lot. And I eventually started reading a lot of post-structuralism, which was the kind of complete opposite to the painting tubers that I work with, because they were all old modernists. So they were very formalist in their approach. They didn't, um, they didn't take kindly to these kind of fancy postmodern ideas being given us by the contextual studies tutors. But I thought there must be some overlap here. There must be some interrelationship. And I think the first time I really came across an artist that really gave me that sense of that overlap between the act of making a painting and mid-80s postmodernism was probably David Sally from New York. I mean, we had all been looking at the latest fashions in painting at the time as art students, which of course was neo-expressionism, which was very much a market-led um, phenomena, very much working against minimalism and conceptual art of the previous generation. So a lot of so-called wild painting, it wasn't really, it was just fake, but hey, they were selling it as kind of somehow this, this, this genuineness of, of, of real painting. So, you know, artists like Ryan Fetting or Salome, for example. And, and, or, or, and also, but what I also discovered at that time was like really great artists who were kind of lumped in with that near expressionist movement, but were not, in fact, really a part of it, such as Martin Kippenberger, who had the cheekiest, fantastic, out there attitude and really took, was really taking the mickey out of art. And I think he was crucial for me as an undergraduate student as well especially when I came to do my MA uh, between 88 and 90 at Goldsmiths. So by the end of my degree in 87, I'd moved to London. I knew then that I wanted to be an artist. So rather than having a fantasy about an artist not knowing what it, what it means, you then go to London with your backpack and your cap um, and you hope, and you dream, and you, I ended up in Goldsmiths, where well, I tried very hard to get into Goldsmiths, because I'd seen the shows the previous year, I bought that year in 87 for the MA, and I thought, I want to go here. These people are just direct, new, and interesting. Okay, so the kind of paintings I was making in, uh, in the Bath Academy of Art were based on some kind of cross-reference between, say, Martin Kippenberg on the one hand, David Sally on the other. Um, and they were very large, they were very expressive, they were figurative. Um, a lot of the, 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 the figures were dressed in 18th century costume, so there's this very Baroque approach to the painting, or Baroque attitude in the painting. They were often doing very zany things, um, holding up telescopes. And there was a critique, in my mind there was a critique of um, um, empirical humanism in these paintings. So I would be thinking about finding these kind of uh, measurement systems like orbs or telescopes that were, although outdated, were still the very root for me of this kind of empirical humanism that kind of pervades our culture even now. Um, and I thought if I could repaint them in a cheeky manner, then somehow, you know, I'd be critiquing the, uh, the humanist uh, desire to kind of, you know, s s make the world scientific, make, put everything into times t to tables so that we can control and understand the world through, through, through charts and language. I was making expressionist, expressionist figurative paintings up until I went to the MA. And at the beginning of the MA, for the first year on the MA, I continued with this, but then I started to realise that there was this, this critique of, of, of history uh, and humanism and, you, and, and perhaps modernism, modernist formalism, which had been creeping into my work. Perhaps this wasn't getting across to an audience. So I started to use the same technique um, but paint sweets on a very large scale, very expressionist, and eventually sprinkle hundreds and thousands, you know, those kind of kids' sweet things, which you, the little, tiny little sugary drops in various bright kiddie colours and sprinkle them in the paint wait for them to dry. So I was making kind of funny ha ha paintings and the reason was that I wanted to kind of ask questions about what painting was. One of the things that became apparent to me during my time at Goldsmiths was there was a lot of talk uh, around the so-called death of painting. That painting is a kind of linear 
historical tra trajectory with a kind of, you know, a vision of the future was no longer valid. It was defunct. We were talking about this a lot, and this came out of a lot of post-structuralist thinking that I'd encountered in Bath Art School. So, for example, Jacques Derrida's critique of painting, Jean-Francois Lyotard's postmodern condition, uh, Jean Baudrillard's simulacrum theories, which brought the whole idea of you know our subjective relationship to to the screen into play. All these ideas were being thrown around in the kind of Goldsmith seminar room, and I suddenly thought, well, how am I going to deal with this? You know, I, I think the idea of making neo-expressionist painting, even, albeit with a cheeky, slightly British edge, somehow seemed a bit outdated in the late eighties. So then I had to really think about what I wanted to do. And it was towards the end of the first year, I think, beginning of second year on my, B, on my MA, that I began to develop the stack paintings, or what other people know as the cake paintings. I would use oil paint squeezed through a patissier syringe. So you would have the cake icing um, nozzle on the end of the on the end of the syringe, and you would squeeze it out as if you were making a cake. But crucially, it was oil paint, and this oil paint was going onto canvas. And I would have five canvases all laid out, exactly the same size, exactly one foot square, and I would make the same motif or pattern. It was often a geometric pattern onto each five of the five uh, uh, canvases then I would stack one on top of the other on top of the other on top of the other etc and of course as you put one on top of the other all the paint oozed out of the side very cream like when the painting was finished it was about this big about that high you could only see the top one with the kind of design of the, of the painted uh, patissier uh, the tools um, these paintings were then left to dry for a couple of months and were then put on the wall about arm but this sort of height, so touch height, um, and they were deliberately playing with the idea of being both painting and sculpture. Not painting or sculpture, painting and sculpture. I was trying to bridge that divide. I was saying there was no divide. Also, with the use of the kind of patissier's tool, you know, this is not a paintbrush. So we were working, or I was working against the very idea of the kind of gestured brush mark, the cliché brush mark, de Kooning, for example, or in Britain, Auerbach. For my generation, this was just total cliché. The idea that somehow the gestured mark would somehow represent, or be, no, would, would be a direct presentation of emotion. It's crap. It's total crap. You can, it's, it's, a re, it's a representation of emotion. Whether it be flat painted or gestured, it's, it's just, uh, 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 it, you could fake it. You could fake the emotion in a gesture. So I think a lot of us were working against this idea that somehow you have to be a wild neo-expressionist or a formalist abstract expressionist still living out fantasies of the 50s. So by squeezing through a patissier's tool, what you're doing is you're saying, this is a joke. This is joke gesture. This was my death of painting. Okay, so these paintings were presented first in the Chisholm Hill Gallery in 1990, a group show with um, soon to graduate Goldsmith students. I sold some. First time I'd ever done anything like that. Um, and they were written up, written about in the Independent newspaper by Andrew Graham Dixon, which was great for a young art student like me. I was in my 27, something like that, uh, 28 perhaps. Um, but this made me realise that I could be serious with what I was doing as an artist. Okay, so we're all in London. We're all we had we had we were organising independent studios called Curtain Road Arts. There's a bunch of ex Goldsmith students, including myself, just finding a building in Shoreditch because the recession was still in force in '92. We had that studio throughout the 90s for virtually no money, which is unheard of now, to get cheap studio, warehouse studio in the centre of London. It was a crazy place. We were not organised in any way. We did put exhibitions on, but you know we often failed to pay the rent. The roof was always leaking. The toilets often broke. Um, it was freezing cold, but it was a lot of fun. We drank a lot. 
we went out to a lot of openings, we went to a lot of parties. It was good fun. But it gave me the, the time and freedom post the cake paintings to think about how I was going to reimagine painting. And I was trying all sorts, making all sorts of weird and wonderful experiments, most of which I see and look back on now as, as failures, but necessary failures. So in 1999, after seven years of great fun in Curtin Road Art Studios, um, we, we had to close. The landlord wanted to sell the building and so that it could become the shortage that everybody knows now, tragically. Very commercial. Um, and it was at this point that I uh, managed to get a place on the Goldsmiths PhD, the new, the new Goldsmiths PhD. I was given a studio there. I was there for four years in all. Um, and it was during that time I developed my, the painting practice that I always wanted to develop alongside my written thesis um, that work the work that you see here is a direct result of that, that period between 99 and 2003 you know, when I'm making the paintings, you know, I, I think I explained earlier on, I start with something. I start with, you know, a symbol that it has some perhaps narrative content for me, such as the Wi-Fi symbol, or a word such as virus, which also has a certain cultural resonance, or a dice, or a the play symbol. Um, so, you know, I'll be thinking while I've been on the screen and I've just been using this symbol for whatever purpose and it has a narrative function for me or some relationship to, to my personal life but that's just really a very casual beginning so that when I start to kind of introduce signage into the painting after for example putting the first colour ground down um, you know I, it gives me something to start with because the end result of the painting is very difficult to achieve because what I don't want to do is, is, is to have the signs reading... I mean, I don't want to make quotational sign paintings. Somehow this falls back into very much sort of David Sally postmodern kind of juxtaposition. I think painting for me is... Um, I think it's almost like a kind of a reforming of formalism here. Almost like a kind of digimodernism, if you like. So it's it's... As, I, as, I, as I'm progressing through the painting, going through the process of layering, of pour, painting, pouring, peeling, but not necessarily in that order, I then begin to think about not what the sign has represents as a narrative, as a cultural narrative, but how it can kind of play out in the kind of schemata of the painting, the form of the painting. So in that sense, it could be argued that I'm utilising the tropes of modernist formalism but I like to think I'm bringing contemporary signage and contemporary materials into use or inter, 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 in, in, as an interrelation with that formalism. So if you like, it, it, this term digimodernism is going around at the moment. I think it's a good term to kind of think about utilising modernist tropes in relation to, to the digital realm. And that's great for pictorial making and I think for, for, the, for the physicality of painting. So, when I'm making the painting, I'm kind of making it up as I go along. I have no plan in mind, no colour scheme. I don't use sketchbooks. I, 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 just, I just work ad hoc with what's, what's there in front of me. So I come into the studio in the morning, fresh, and I think, I need to put a yellow paw there, or I need to put a symbol there, or I need to paint... Um, a square in there, or I need to pour a transparency over a symbol there, wherever. Um, and I sort of, I, I make it up as I go along, but what I try and do is challenge myself every time to try configurations out that I haven't tried before, and that's really important. When I'm making these paintings, you know, obviously they're, they're, they, they, they come, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a certain amount of spillage with the paintings. So, for example, if you look on the side of the paintings, I leave the drips deliberately to reference the fact that you can see there are many, many layers in the paintings. I don't paint them out. I leave the evidence of the materiality and the process. This is important. 
Ending a painting is very difficult for me. Um, so I've got this kind of what I've got. So so what I try and achieve is this kind of simultaneous but multiplicious relationship between the varying parts of the painting: the drip, the pour, the symbol, the opacity of the house paint, the transparency of the varnish, into into um, into a configuration that looks looks or has the appearance of being formally correct as a painting but that you get the, because of the competing underlays and the competing um, relationship with the transparent areas that you're never quite sure about where that form finishes or ends so your eye is constantly moving around the painting questioning the final composition so in a sense it's an uncomposition it's an open composition it's, a, it's, it's an ever expanding composition and to get that balance I find extremely difficult it would be so much easier to find a correct formal decision to, to finish a painting. But of course, as I said, there are so many competing elements which, which, which are exacerbated by the um, transparency and the opacity in relation to the signs that make it impossible for me to do that. And I want that impossibility. Otherwise, I would, it, these paintings would be reactionary and pointless and very much harking back to um, formless painting of the past.